From opening day in 1904 until the park itself was destroyed by fire in 1911, one of the Dreamland theme park's most successful attractions was the Lilliputian Village. For the seven years of Dreamland's existence, the village was home to several hundred residents, all of whom exhibited some form of dwarfism. These people performed a pantomime of the daily activities of any town resident, but for the benefit of average-sized visitors. That's weird, right? Obviously, sideshows were popular at the time, and those were all about exhibiting people with physical differences, but a whole village? What was that about? I'm going to try to answer that, and that means we're going to go on a bit of a journey to talk about how folks with dwarfism have been treated throughout history and how that led to the Lilliputian village. But first, it would mean a lot to me if you could like this video, and if you're into this kind of thing, subscribe. That helps YouTube decide to promote this to other viewers who might enjoy it as well. And uh, possibly more importantly, it helps me know that you're out there watching. It kind of gives me an impetus to make more of these. So let's start with some definitions. Dwarfism is a catch-all term for several types of medical condition that result in a fully grown adult being under the height of 4 foot 10. The most common of these conditions is achondroplasia, a genetic disorder that results in shortened arms and legs and an average sized torso and head, and that accounts for about 70% of those with dwarfism. The next most common variety of dwarfism is a deficiency of human growth hormone, which results in the person's entire body being significantly smaller than average, although head and torso remain proportionate to the limbs. As long as humans have existed, some of us have been dramatically smaller than others, and as a result, this has attracted attention, both welcome and unwelcome. In ancient Egypt, people with dwarfism were considered a sort of good luck omen from the gods and were therefore treated relatively well, with depictions showing them dressed in fine clothes and carrying staffs that indicate they were high-ranking priests and officials. But one weird thing about that. The number of bodies of people with dwarfism that archaeologists have found buried in Egypt is really, really high. Like, way higher than what you would expect given the population. And that means that the Egyptians were almost certainly acquiring some of these people from neighboring regions and probably buying them as well. Because through a lot of history, people with dwarfism were often treated like property. Others saw their differences and wanted to own that difference, whether it was because they saw them as a sign from the gods, like in Egypt, or just an amusing novelty, like in Rome. In Europe, during the Middle Ages, people with dwarfism even became seen as fashionable among royalty, and many were brought in to amuse the court. Again, it was common to purchase them and hold them as property. Dehumanizing competitions even arose between members of the courts. Peter the Great's sister, Alexievna, supposedly kept 93 people with dwarfism in bondage just to impress her rivals. These people were often degraded for the amusement of others. In the mid-1600s, a man named Geoffrey Hudson was kept as a pet by the English Queen Henrietta of France, wife of Charles I. Geoffrey was forced to perform various tricks for their amusement, including jumping out of a pie and fighting a duel with a turkey. Later in his life, after fleeing to France with the Royalists during the English Civil War, Hudson let it be known that he would no longer act as a pet or a clown for them. A Mr. Croft, who was a member of the court in exile, continued to poke fun at Geoffrey, resulting in Geoffrey Hudson challenging him to a duel. This comes from an account written in the letters of Queen Henrietta. A gentleman of the household, Mr. Croft, lost no time in provoking the dwarf to challenge him. A duel, only meant for fun, was arranged in the park at Nevers. Croft and the dwarf were to meet on horseback, armed with pistols. The jibing cavalier took no firearms, but merely a huge squirt with which he meant at once to extinguish his small adversary and the powder of his weapon. A squirt was sort of like a water gun, usually used to extinguish small fires. So Croft clearly took this duel for a joke and was only intending to humiliate Geoffrey. But unfortunately for him, Geoffrey Hudson wasn't playing. 
The vengeful dwarf, however, managed his good steed with sufficient address to avoid the shower aimed at himself and his loaded pistols, and withal to shoot his laughing adversary dead. I believe this is a medieval example of fucking around and finding out. Unfortunately, Hudson's triumph and favored position in court did not last long. He wound up exiled and then enslaved in North Africa, although he was pretty much enslaved already, and then imprisoned back in England after James II returned to power. He died around 1680 and is buried in an unmarked grave. In the 19th century, it became less popular for royalty to keep people with dwarfism for their amusement, but the general public remained fascinated. Little people born into the working classes often found it difficult to labor to support themselves and their families, and with the rise of circuses and sideshows, other avenues of employment presented themselves. People with dwarfism became popular attractions in these venues, whether performing as clowns or simply allowing the public to view them for a price. However, these freak shows were continued low entertainment and a dishonorable way to make a living. On January 4th, 1838, something happened that would change that perception and pave a road straight to the creation of Dreamland's Lilliputian village. That event was the birth of Charles Sherwood Stratton in Bridgeport, Connecticut. But even if you had been the boy's parents, you would not have noticed anything special about the child until after he was six months old. At that point, he simply seemed to stop growing. By the time he was five years old, it was clear that something unusual was going on since the boy was only one inch taller than he had been at six months, and he had not gained any weight. News of this remarkable child soon spread and came to the attention of another Connecticut native, one Phineas T. Barnum. Barnum had made a name for himself by exhibiting an elderly slave named Joyce Heth. He claimed that Heth was George Washington's wet nurse and he made a lot of money until the old woman died. Now hard up for cash, Barnum was in the market for another hit, and this child sounded like he might just fit the bill. Barnum bargained. Barnum bargained, Barnum bargained, Barnum bargained. Barnum bargained with the boy's parents and came to an arrangement. Barnum would enter into business with the boy's father, teach the boy to sing and dance, and then take the child on a tour of America. But that name has got to go. Nobody wants to see the amazing Stratton. We need something with oomph. Zazz! Wowie zowie! Pizzazz! Well, I don't know what any of those words mean. I am a 19th century carpenter. You know, zippity zing! Bounce! Pep! Kablooey zooey! Please stop shouting a bunch of made up words at me. I gather that you want to change um, young Charlie's name. I guess I'm fine with that as long as it isn't something that uh, degrades him or makes fun of his size or anything like that. General! Tom! Thumb! I see no problem with that. Tom Thumb's U.S. tour was a huge success, and immediately after it concluded, Barnum took the boy to Europe. He added to the child's repertoire, teaching young Tom to impersonate Napoleon and Alexander the Great. Again, it was an enormous success. Young Charlie Stratton was a natural entertainer, and the tour culminated with him being presented to Queen Victoria, who, by all accounts, was extremely amused. Suddenly, dwarfism was back in fashion. But now, the expectation was that the folks with dwarfism weren't there merely to be gawked at, but to entertain their audience with songs, jokes, dances, or impersonations like the famous Tom Thumb. Whenever interest in Tom Thumb began to flag, Barnum, being Barnum, was quick to stoke the fires of curiosity. In 1863, the inclinations of the human heart worked for Barnum to arrange an astounding spectacle. Tom Thumb had fallen in love with one Lavinia Warren, a former schoolteacher and a dancer who had entered Barnum's employ. It was obvious that wedding bells were in their future, and Phineas Barnum knew that this was an opportunity he could not slip by. He produced the wedding, just as he would any other of his publicity stunts, framing it as a fairy wedding and, quote, the biggest little thing that was ever known. He stopped short of charging guests to attend the wedding, 
but he definitely charged them to attend the reception. $75 a piece for 5,000 people. How much would that have earned him in today's money? Uh, let's see, pulling up the ever useful inflation calculator and 8869404 dollars and 76 cents damn barnum was good fun fact this wedding was so popular that people started reenacting it a few years later given that most adults don't fit the bill to perform as tom thumb in terms of height these zealous uh thumbelows used their own children to get close to the overall effect. Don't worry, the weddings weren't legally binding for the five to seven year olds participating, it was just for fun, but that tradition caught on and is still being done to this day in many East Coast communities. So obviously people with dwarfism could be exhibited in hugely profitable ways. And one of the keys to this barn burner of an event was that it featured not just Tom Thumb, but also Lavinia Warren, Minnie Warren, and Commodore Nutt. You like people with dwarfism? How about four people with dwarfism? And they're doing a thing, a thing that average size people do, but, you know, smaller. Now, diminutive performers were expected to sing and dance, but also for groups of them to act out everyday situations, but in miniature. So it continued over the course of the next few decades, until the heyday of Coney Island's Golden Age. There were many attractions that featured small people on the island, including Luna Park's trip to the moon. The strange selenites who greeted visitors were played by small people wearing outlandish clothes and offering up samples of green cheese, for instance. No park featured a more impressive dwarvish attraction than Dreamland's Lilliputia. The brainchild of one-time child acrobat and future Ringling Brothers circus manager Samuel Gumpert's Lilliputia was billed as a living community rendered in miniature, and indeed it took much of its architectural inspiration from Nuremberg, Germany. 300 people with dwarfism lived and performed in the attraction. The area featured an opera house, a police department, and miniature criminals for them to arrest, a tavern, a restaurant, and a fire department which responded to fire alarms at regular intervals throughout the day. In order to play up the size of the buildings and people, one of the park's giants would take periodic strolls through the area, towering over the residents. To really solidify Lilliputia as a world-class attraction, however, Gumpertz sought out one of the superstars of the dwarfish world. He first reached out to a diminutive British performer named Little Titch, famous for his big boots dance in the British musicals. But Titch did not wish to travel overseas. General Tom Thumb had unfortunately passed away 20 years before, but his wife, Lavinia Warren, was still alive and, what's more, had married another small performer who went by the name Count Magri, which had supposedly been bestowed upon him by Pope Pius IX. Together, they had been traveling the world, performing in plays like The Rivals and Gulliver Among the Lilliputians, but they were getting on in years. Lavinia was in her early 60s, and Gumpert's pitched Lilliputia as not only a place to perform and get paid, but also as a community that was tailored to people of their size. Lavinia agreed. On November 28, 1904, a syndicated newspaper article appeared in the Villas County News that featured an interview with Lavinia at her new home. I'll read some selections from that piece now, but if you want to hear the whole thing, I'll post it as a bonus video on my Patreon account. Link below. In a miniature castle hard by the minarets of Dreamland dwells Mrs. General Tom Thumb, the fairy godmother of at least two generations of children and the legendary heroine of all of us from the nursery up. Everybody knows that Mrs. Thumb McGree, nay Warren, is 65. Like queens and other royalties, she is on record. Every year counts. They have touched her very lightly, however. Her figure is plumper than of yore. But there isn't a gray hair on her head. And when she takes off the tiny gold-rimmed spectacles, her fine dark eyes are almost as bright as they were on the day of her first marriage somewhere back in the early 60s. That marriage to the redoubtable General Tom Thumb 
an event of which there is a pictorial record in the form of an oil painting on the ornamental case of the diamond edition Wheeler and Wilson sewing machine, which was one of the wedding presents. The Countess keeps this machine in her Lilliputian parlor at Dreamland. Two dreamers of the world's metropolitan section were dispatched to Lilliput to find out what Mrs. Tom Thumb might be up to in the way of dramatic work. Well, we approached from the sea after dark. The spectacle of the domes, towers, and battlements outlined in incandescent fire set the artist wild with color schemes and appealed to the word impressionist for fine writing and unlimited space. But we had a mission. A little cop told us to move on, so we ducked into the boiled-down city with its population of over a hundred human atoms. Our first impression was that we were 11 feet tall and still growing. We sauntered over to the circus tent. Evidently, there was something doing worthwhile as a large audience sat spellbound. Lillian Russell was there in a fetching white sailor suit looking like a schoolgirl and chewing gum like one. Mademoiselle Teresa, a petite lady athlete in mauve tights, was doing some remarkable stunts on a trapeze. Then came Tom, the Pony Paradox. Tom is an equine datus who is great at figures, answers all sorts of questions by shaking and nodding his head and pawing in the sand. Outside the theater, her coach waited. It is the identical coach presented to Tom Thumb in 1884 by the Prince of Wales, now King Edward VII of England. This is a swagger vehicle in every respect, of the best London make. When we returned to the Countess's salon, we found her a charming and hospitable hostess, while the two little middle-aged gentlemen, her husband and brother-in-law, had donned formal evening dress and were ready to converse on topics of the day in English, French, Italian, or Spanish, as we might prefer. And in talking with them, one soon forgets their diminutive stature. Our own enormous bulk is another matter, as we step gingerly over dwarf pianos and bedsteads and finally crouch down on the floor, so as to be in speaking range of the Lady of the Domicile. Oh, our theater sketch is just play circus, you know, she laughs. Let me tell you the determining reason why I accepted the summer engagement here, at my age and when presumably I don't need the money. Well, I have a fine, comfortable home in Middleborough, Massachusetts. The trouble is that it is too comfortable. When I go there, I am petted and coddled like the Empress of China. I am not allowed to lift a finger to do anything for myself. The result is that I become listless and luxurious and, what is worse, fat. Well, permit us to ask, Countess, how does the grown-up world look to a midget? Just the same as to anyone else, I fancy. At any rate, I am almost entirely unconscious of differences in size. After all, they are merely relative. A diminutive person may have grown-up ideas, intelligence, heart and soul, and vice versa. It never occurs to me, for instance, to regard my husband as anything other than a full-sized man. The curfew rings at 11.30 p.m., and we two giants rise cautiously from the floor so as not to knock our heads through the ceiling. The Countess and her husband bid us a courteous good night. Lilliputia remained one of Dreamland's most popular attractions until the park was consumed by fire in 1911. Obviously, in the century or so since Lilliputia existed, attitudes towards people with dwarfism have changed considerably, though perhaps not as much as many would wish. Like the fairy wedding party and attractions like Lilliputia, in the age of the motion picture, dwarfs were called upon to portray otherworldly creatures, whether they were munchkins or Ewoks or whatever it was that Willow was. Slowly, those roles went from caricatures like munchkins to more nuanced portrayals, actual characters like Willow Ufgood. And in the present day, stars like Peter Dinklage perform fully fleshed out characters like Tyrion Lannister, and some not specifically written for people with dwarfism like Cyrano de Bergerac. Organizations like Little People of America advocate for greater understanding of dwarfs in all walks of life. Unfortunately, there is still pretty far to go. For every Cyrano de Bergerac played by Peter Dinklage, there are several roles that many believe contribute to continued stigmatization, like Mini-Me, a role that gave Vern Troyer stardom, but also pigeonholed him and unfortunately gave bullies one more name to shout at their short victims. But hey, 
At least there aren't entire towns constructed as human zoos for people with dwarfism, right? You're looking at the newest and hottest theme park in China right now. There are no rides or roller coasters, no cotton candy or games, just lots and lots of little people. I really appreciate you taking some time to watch this today, and if you haven't done so already, it would really help me out if you could like and subscribe. And if you want to support me even more, you can check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash tybannerman. Link will be below. I've got some cool rewards slated to go there, including a full reading of the interview with Lavinia and more bonus to come. And thank you for leaving me.